finished reading uh, chapter two of uh, Baby Rudin. Uh, the way this project is going, uh, there will be a lot of early reading, and uh, because I'm reading multiple books. <clears throat> but then, at some point, I would like to get into uh, problem set mode. I already started, uh, but I really want to want to take my time uh, and work on a long problem set, maybe like a month or so. Uh, that's really the long-term plan. But getting back to uh, chapter two, uh, it took me a while. It took me a while to read the whole chapter. And uh, it's got a lot of good stuff. I tried uh, wherever I could uh, to come up with diagrams, um, went through these definitions, looked some things up, uh, sometimes in Wikipedia, sometimes in ChatGPT, went through this whole table. Um, yeah, and just generally read every single theorem. I did what I usually do in my notes, where when a theorem is mentioned in another theorem, I'll actually go back and write it out um, and that that tends to help me uh, to work through the ideas so that's the book of course with uh, uh, Rudin ba being a poem it's just a few pages but it actually took hours and hours uh, to read and I'll mention something about Wade uh, when I get to my notes so it's right in here you can see that this quest has barely just begun and so I'm going about Two weeks, if I map between the last one, a little over two weeks. But I know because I'm doing whole books sometimes to understand the concepts that uh, these are going to be sometimes months apart. That's just the way this project, uh, this way, the way I want to do this project. I want to take my time, uh, do it once, do it right. So this is uh, in a Bart Bartle and Sherber vi video, and I'm separating the videos by book so that. In the future, somebody can go through it. Who, wh whoever's only interested in uh, that book, they don't need to uh, spend all this time going looking through a, a playlist for all of the Baby Rudin project. Went through every section, of uh, course, equ equivalence relations, um, mapping uh, integers to the natural numbers. This is content that is normally found in many analysis books. Yeah. Then diagonalization arguments, so a little bit of set theory. Uh, of course, some of this is also, it's really in every proofs book. Uh, I was showing it also when I was talking about another book. Then a um, little bit about metric spaces, which tells you why uh, working through Rudin is such a challenge. Uh, he really is doing multi-dimensional, single dimensions. Uh, metric spaces, all these concepts, all at the same time, and that—that's why it's worth—it's uh, worth it for me to do this uh, little challenge of mine. Then, when it came to uh, convexity rules, I've seen this before, but I have to come back to it. I have to come back to it carefully to understand it well. I did a little bit of it uh, when I read Wade, but it's not fresh in my mind. It doesn't just roll off, even though I know that this is really all this is doing is plotting. A, uh, a convex curve. Uh, then running through all the definitions in points of topology, at one point I actually went into ChatGPT and asked, what's the difference between a limit point and an interior point? And so yes, interior points are used to define open sets, whereas limit points describe the accumulation or convergence behavior of points within a set. They're not exactly the same thing. And wherever I could, I drew diagrams, because as we all know, there are no diagrams in Rudin. So every single theorem, that's what I would try to do. Uh, this one was very interesting, and I, I've seen this before. Again, in proofs books, in hammock, uh, it's, and drawing the diagram is a lot easier for me being a visual person. So uh, the, uh, you, you take the union of a bunch of sets, and you do the complement of that, which is the outside, and that is equal to the intersection of all of the complements of the individual, uh, of all the individual complements. So if you, uni if you intersect these, you get that. Or little diagrams for uh, set theory, uh, as laid out uh, in Rudin. Very interesting here. When I when I was working through this, 
of the collections of open sets that are open, the intersections of open sets that are open. It's always close, close, open, open. But I made these statements, the intersection of open sets is open. But then after I read this, I remembered, yes, of course, I did this in Wade. Not always, because the intersection of an infinite collection of open sets need not be open. Of course, if you do this interval, as you keep going in, all right, um, there's nothing. So, yeah. Okay, so then I kept trying to do more diagrams. And in some cases, I feel like I succeeded, but in others, I feel like I don't. Um, like, for example, in here, I... Yeah, not there visually. I try to draw it, and I, I think I know what the proof is about. You try to make a construction where eventually as you, uh, as things progress, if you started where they're, com where they're joining, they'll fa fall apart from each other, or if they're supposed to be separate from each other, eventually something happens and they come together. And that's usually how all these proofs work out. Yeah, see, trying to see how something would go away from the other sets. But in some cases, it ju I just wasn't there for me to draw a diagram for my own visual way of learning things um, that would work. Of course, nested intervals. Then uh, I looked up K cells. Uh, and of course, in higher dimensions, uh, there are more projections than anything. They have to be projections. But queso really is just a, a rectangle in two-dimensional space, linus one dimension, and a parallel pipette, parallel pipette in R3. Of course, way back when in engineering, I used to do some with parallel pipettes because they are very common in uh, things that you do in uh, electrical engineering, like ma uh, material science. So, yep. I don't like the when uh, when somebody does IN is not really a subset of IN plus 1, but IN plus 1 is a subset of IN. I always like to flip it. It's just so I can remember it. And so, of course, uh, one of the things that I like about, about Rudin, but sometimes it can be a pain, is his incredibly brief theorem statements. They're actually pretty good. It just, yeah, it's just the way Rudin is. And that's fine. And sometimes he reaches a contradiction and he doesn't say that he has. So you kind of, you have to know. And, and I understand that. You have to be paying attention. I understand that. Uh, then, uh, this was interesting. And this is where Wade comes in. Because this really tells you, I, I hope it does, how, how difficult it can be to read Rudin when it's the first time you've encountered an analysis. I, I, I'm glad that I was never in those shoes. Uh, because... Here, in Theorem 241, which, if we look up Theorem 241, it's right here. This is page 40 of the book. The book has barely begun. And Rudin is dropping on you an n-dimensional proof that has the Heim-Borel theorem. I say Heim-Borel, I think I've heard it's Heine-Borel, but... Pain is not painy, so I'm thinking Hein is not Heine. That's just me. Anyways, so Rudin tells us here the equivalence of A and B in the next theorem is the hein borel theorem. So the equivalence of E is closed and bounded, then E is compact. That equivalence is the hein borel theorem. And sure enough, in the case of Wade, and I've marked it here, Wade actually has the first mention of the hein borel theorem in way deep in chapter 9. So this is where, this is why I think, number one, I'm glad that I read Wade. Number two, I'm glad that I read Wade before I attended Rudin, and I'm glad that I never convinced myself through my ego that I was smart enough to uh, attempt Rudin without having read a lot of analysis somewhere else. I, I think that would have been a complete and total disaster. As it is, this is already challenging enough, and I'm basing my reading of Rudin on something else. And so, of course, a lot of these proofs uh, have uh, metric space equivalents. So, for example, in Wade, he's got the very succinct and brief hein borel theorem, very similar to the one that is in Chapter 2 of, of, of Rudin. But then, 
In the chapter on metric spaces, he restates the theorem in the language of metric, metric spaces. And we see that as a theme also in Rudin, where a, a theorem is stated using points of topology, and it's, a, it's brief, but the same theorem can be rewarded in old-style uh, non-points of topology. I'm going to call it old-style. So that was a very interesting uh, instance where I was like, mm, I'm, I'm curious. I want to read in Wade to see when you hit the hein -Borel theorem. And again, I'm sorry if I, call, I would keep calling it hein -Borel and it's Heine. I like Hein better. That's just me. Then uh, Rudin uh, kind of alluded to somewhere where he does L2 space. I, I need to learn a lot about metric spaces. And so he makes a reference to it later in the book. I tried to follow it. I got lost. I'll have to pick it up some other time. So note to self, L2, need to look it up. Then, yes, I tried sometimes to make diagrams and I was partly successful. I think this is another comeback diagram. Later on, when I read this same proof or a similar proof in other books, I'll have to come back and really understand what exactly Rudin was doing here. The uh, Cantor set, which I've seen before, and it's in Abbott and other books. Very interesting the way Rudin describes it. I like it. I like the way he describes it. I really like this best from what I've seen before. Uh, then things about connected sets. And there is chapter two of Rudin.